Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Regame and Citicom video we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. Let's start things out with Timothy Lotz, who had a recent interview with Edge Magazine. Now, Timothy works for AMD and gave a rather fascinating series of quotes regarding his opinion of the specification requirements for the next generation consoles. He said that we will need 7.4 teeflops of GPU performance to hit 4K 30fps for the next generation systems. But what's rather fascinating about this quote is he adds that that will be for only PS4 quality visuals. In short, if you want better pixel quality along with your 4K 30 FPS, you're going to need additional GPU performance on top of that. So there's a couple of things that we need to take into consideration. The first is that current systems are without question CPU bound. Whether we're referring to the base model PS4 all the way up to the Xbox One X, they all use AMD Jaguar processors. Yes, they're clocked at different speeds from 1.6 GHz to 2.3 GHz, but essentially they are identical with a few tweaks here and there. There are eight total cores, However, 6.5 of those, with the 7th core offering around 50% utilization available for games developers, it does go up and down a little bit, depending what else is going on in the system, but let's just say 50% for a nice median number. So 6.5 cores then, at whatever clock speed. In the case of the Xbox One X, 2.3 GHz. He went on record and said that the next generation of Xbox, so far codenamed Scala, is to target higher frame rates than the current generation of Xbox systems. To do that, he wants to fix the issues with the Jaguar processors, in other words, the disparity between CPU and GPU power. So then, we're going to have faster CPUs. It appears that AMD will be providing Sony the Zen or Zen Plus CPUs for the PlayStation 5, and we could make a safe assumption that we'll see Zen Plus or possibly Zen 2 in the next generation Xbox, depending on the release date. The rumors are that it's gonna be around a year after the PlayStation 5, but who really knows for certain? That will be imperative because even if they were to render a game at a really low resolution, let's say 1080p or 720p on the Xbox One X, because some of the games are open world and they've just got an awful lot of physics, foliage, NPCs, draw distances and goodness knows what else, essentially stuff which needs to be uh, ran, you can't then ask that CPU to do that in half the time, it just does not have the resources. You would need to be considerably fast, like 3 or even 4 gigahertz with the same architecture. To give an idea of just how slow these console CPUs are in comparison to a modern desktop, you can get a really nice uh, game experience on a PC with just a couple of CPU cores in comparison and easily hit 30 FPS at 4K, depending on the GPU. I'm actually putting together a really nice CPU scaling video, but I actually have already got one up on the channel which shows Doom running at 4K at 60-ish FPS. It does dip occasionally, but with only a single CPU core and an i7-8700. Obviously, there are a couple of things going on there. The first is that it does have a major clock speed advantage, and the second is it also has IPC advantages. After all, AMD Jaguar is just a low-power CPU, designed originally for things such as tablets. But it does lead us to an awfully good question. What will the next generation of consoles bring to the table? Personally, I would be happy to see a choice there here. I would be happy to see the option from developers to allow us as end users to say, well, gee, I want to target 1440p at this resolution, uh, sorry, at this frame rate. Another possibility is that we could still see roughly the same resolutions we've got now, and obviously checkerboard rendering and that type of thing are becoming increasingly popular, but with higher frame rates. Another possibility is we will still see 4K and 30 fps of course most likely it's going to depend on the game itself much like now and what the developer is trying to do and that's not even including such next generation techniques as ray tracing i'm still iffy whether we're going to see ray tracing in consoles the reason i'm hoping we will is because obviously that would push it to the limelight in pc gaming as well i wouldn't be surprised if we still see it but possibly just in very limited 
situations, possibly where developers know that they have full control over the scene. For example, let's say it's a cutscene or a walking, talking section. Those type of things where there's not a great deal of action and they know that the frame rate budget isn't going to suddenly go out of whack because you're being attacked by a 20 foot monster. I'm actually waiting to do a full analysis on the next generation of consoles. I've just got so much other stuff I'm working on at the moment. And quite frankly, I would like more leaks available for what type of specifications we're going to be getting. But with that said, I'll pass the question over to you. What type of uh, visual quality difference would you like from the current generation to the next generation? Do you expect a large visual jump or would you prefer just higher frame rates, slightly improved um, visual quality, but mostly just do you want that native 4K or would you prefer something else? Let me know in the comments down below. Driver stability and driver quality are without question two of the most important aspects of buying a GPU. And for a long time, Nvidia have been thought to have the more stable driver revisions, but that's not the case. According to an independent uh, series of tests, it has been discovered that AMD have better driver stability over NVIDIA. AMD systems passed 401 out of 432 tests, while NVIDIA systems passed 356 out of 432 tests. That means that AMD have a 93% pass rate and NVIDIA have just 82%. QA consultants tested six of AMD's most popular graphics cards. This is ranging from the uh, Vega 64, the RX 580, the 560, and a couple of the Radeon Pros as well. Conducting four hour crash tests on each GPU consecutively, six times a day for 12 days. Now I'm gonna give a quick five cents of my own experiences here, and obviously your experiences may differ. But as a reviewer, and as someone who has been gaming on PC for a long time, I have to say, AMD's drivers have improved immeasurably over the past several years. Back in the day, it was fair to say that ATI and then in the early days of AMD drivers were somewhat buggy. You could get crashes and uh, yeah, there were some times where you would get like texture glitches and goodness knows what else. And particularly at the point where you were starting to transition from Windows 98 and uh, XP and then start to move more towards a Vista and Windows 7. Legacy games were just kind of buggy and often you would find that they would run a lot better on NVIDIA GPUs. But in my opinion anyway, right now, the GPU drivers for both companies are pretty interchangeable. It really comes down to personal preference. What I mean by that is what driver control panel software are you more used to? Now, I personally have not really had that many issues with NVIDIA drivers and I've not really had that many problems with AMD drivers of late. You can start to get a couple of weird things if you start doing a lot of alt tabbing, especially if you're doing like down sampling and all that stuff. You can occasionally be the, the odd oddity there, but generally speaking, I've not had any stability issues at all with either AMD or NVIDIA, apart from the odd crash here or there, but let's face it, these things do happen. Uh, obviously, if you're overclocking, though, that can lend that extra uh, bit of uh, fun to the mix. But I find that even then, most drivers are pretty easy to recover if there is a crash. So I'm curious, what's your opinion on this? Have you had any major issues with NVIDIA or AMD drivers? So leave your opinions down below in the comments. Now on to a piece of NVIDIA news, and this is focused on deep learning. Specifically, restoration or improvements of grainy slash low light photos. So, of course, we've all taken that photo that just doesn't look quite what you'd expect it to. Perhaps you've taken it in low light, or perhaps you took an, an image of something really far away and it just looked a bit blurry or a bit grainy and you just thought, oh gosh, well, that kind of sucks. And you do the best you can, maybe quickly run it through Photoshop or whatever, adjust the, the levels and shadows and whatever else, and you do your best, but gosh darn it, it just doesn't look quite how you'd want. Well, deep learning is here to the rescue. According to a team of researchers from NVIDIA, Alato University, and MIT, they will be presenting an international, they will be presenting at the International Conference on Machine Learning in Stockholm, Sweden. 
and recent deep learning work in the field has focused on training a neural network to restore images by showing examples of both a noisy and a clean image. In other words, they'll show a noisy version of the image and then also the clean version of the image so that the neural network can say, oh, okay, well, this is what I need to do to clean the image up and to make it look much better. Now, there are multiple uses for this. Of course, there is always restoring those really uh, cool photos that you took and then you just never been able to use because they just look too noisy. But there are also some really awesome scientific uses. For example, medical uses or, uh, for example, medical scanners or perhaps even um, deep space photography. The team said that there are several real-world situations where obtaining clean training data is difficult. Low-light photography, example, astronomical imaging, physically-based rendering, and magnetic resonance imaging. Our proof-of-concept demonstrations point the way to significant potential benefits in those applications by removing the need for potentially strenuous collection of clean data. Of course, there is no free lunch, and we cannot learn to pick up features that are not there in input data, but this applies to equally to training with clean targets. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.